republish it, you know, put your own words on it. Yeah, I know she was trying to uh, stir up the base and so forth and reach sympathy, but it is a copyright production, and uh, and it's capitalizing on a horrific event. But then that's the nature of news. Um, let's see here. A few other things on my mind. Um, da -da 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 -da. Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, uh, health care reform, whatever you call it. Well, it goes into full law on October 1st of this year. In other words, all the, imp all the elements of it are f to be fully implemented by uh, the 1st of October. And, of course, there's a lot of media spin about what it is and what it isn't. Uh, Fox is, of course, against it. And, uh, let's see, who else? Basically, Republicans and a lot of Americans say it's, well, the government's forcing us to get health care and all that. Well, I'm here to tell you the Affordable Care Act is a law that, among other things, um, is not government run health care. Okay, it's not about health care at all. For one, it does allow those who previously could not afford health insurance a chance to get it. Okay? In other words, it's a level playing field, allows you the opportunity to get health care at a reasonable cost. Two, it forces the insurance companies to actually spend a reasonable amount of money that you pay them on your medical needs. Okay. Number three, it cuts, it, uh, cuts waste and unnecessary cost in the healthcare system. And four, it forces people who can't afford health insurance to buy it instead of costing you more money by having to pay for those people who use the emergency system for health care. Okay, so let's knock the uh, political pandering and other nonsense off and get to what it really is rather than what you think it is. Now, do I like all aspects of it? No, I don't like the government telling me that I have to have it. But I tell you, it's pretty damn hard to get health care coverage or health care when you don't have coverage or have some form of plan. I would be dead now, probably, if I didn't have health insurance. Three years ago, I was in the hospital for four days being treated for diverticulitis. I had at least three blood transfusions while I was in the hospital. Very expensive, by the way. I would not be here today if it weren't for health care coverage. Now, I'm sure they looked over my plan and said, this guy is loaded. He has a pretty good plan. And I admit, I've got a pretty good plan thanks to my employer, and I am grateful for it. And I can't imagine what it would be like right now if I didn't have a job or I didn't have health care coverage. You know, I would probably be very nervous over the next two weeks thinking the feds are going to come down on me saying I don't have health care coverage. But this notion, though, that it's socialized medicine, well, guess what? There are flaws in the free enterprise system, and one of the biggest flaws is health care insurance, okay, health insurance in general. I don't like everything that health insurance companies are doing. You know, to me, insurance companies are a lot like what Mark Twain said about bankers, that a banker will be your best friend until you need him. And one of his quotes was, a banker is like a friend who will loan you an umbrella, but the moment it starts raining, they want that umbrella back. And it's time to change the system. But instead of us trying to repeal it and not put something in its place, you know, let's fix the Affordable Care Act, make it fair for everybody, and not try and not threaten to defund it simply because you're trying to score political points with your constituency. You know, people like Boehner and Cantor, I can't stand, or Fred Thompson. I was somewhat of a fan of Fred Thompson when he ran for president. I think it was in '08. But when he said, you don't need to, uh, we don't need this system, I said, to hell with you, sir. <laughs> I'm not supporting your ass. You will not be my president. Not if I can help it. And I'm glad he 
didn't get very far in his uh, presidential campaign. So let's, instead of trying to demonize the system or to say we don't need it, let's fix it and make it work. It's the law of the land now. So the only way it won't be is if the uh, Supreme Court strikes it down, which they didn't. They said it's a tax. Or if Congress writes a new law and the president signs it and phases it out. Well, guess what? President Obama ain't going to sign that. I can tell you that right now. This is his pride and joy. So let's make it work. Okay? Um, boy, this is probably about the longest winded segment I've had on the opening of a show. And uh, I could sideline this for another day, but I won't because I want to get it out of my chest right now. And then I have a funny story I want to tell you about what happened this past Saturday at a local restaurant with yours truly. Uh, this is an editorial I found online yesterday, and I don't remember what site it was on. I should have kept it. But it's an interesting commentary on uh, movies, in particular of uh, basically liberal movies, especially of uh, race or gender. Okay, And it's an interesting take on The Butler. And this is... I've forgotten who the... Uh, writer was, but it says why I won't be watching The Butler and 12 Years a Slave. The author writes, as a black person I can honestly say I am exhausted and bored with these kinds of dramatic race films. Lee Daniels' new film The Butler is now a box office success, already generating Oscar buzz, but I'm not interested in seeing it. I'm also skipping British filmmaker, uh, filmmaker Steve McQueen's 12 Years a Slave, another movie about black people dealing with slavery. I'm convinced these black race films <clears throat> are created for a white liberal audience, film audience, to engender white guilt and make them feel bad about themselves. Regardless of your race, these films are unlikely to teach you anything you don't already know. Frankly, why can't black people get over slavery? Or at least, why doesn't anyone want to see uh, more contemporary portrayals of black lives? The narrow range of films about the black life experience being produced by, uh, by Hollywood is actually dangerous because it limits the imagination. It doesn't allow real progress to take place. Yet, sadly, these roles are some of the only ones open to black talent. People want us to cheer that black actors from The Butler and 12 Years a Slave are likely to be for, up for Best Actor and Actress Awards. Yet, it feels like a throwback almost to the uh, Gone with the Wind era. I uh, am not against revisiting the past, but there are already enough numerous black films that have covered the civil rights era and slavery. The quandary with black movies is that they are overly fixated on the past, only depicting black suffering in relations to race, which is bizarre and peculiar. Can a black film be created about black people not focusing on race? Is race the only central conflict in the lives of people of color. I don't know about other black people, but I don't sit around all day thinking about only, only uh, think, <laughs> I don't sit around all day thinking only about the fact I am black. I think about the problems in my life, the struggles, the joys, the happiness, most of which don't involve the issue of race. As a black person, I can honestly say I am exhausted and bored with these kinds of dramatic race films. I might have to turn in my black card, but uh, because I don't care much about slavery. I already watched the uh, television series Roots, which I feel covered the subject matter extremely well. Of course, I understand slavery is an important part of any black person's history, but dwelling on slavery is pathetic. It did it in North America over a hundred years ago, yet since uh, Django Unchained made over $400 million last year, um, more slavery movies have emerged. These movies present a false narrative that life is so much better for black people now. It is true that progress has indeed taken place. Black people don't have to sit at the back of the bus and are no longer slaves. However, there are so many stories that need to be told about the black life experience beyond two specific eras in black history. Another film I won't... Uh, be seen in the fall is the biopic 
about Nelson Mandela starring uh, Idris Elba. Um, how many biopics can be made about Nelson Mandela and the apartheid era in South Africa? Honestly, I lost count. I'm not saying there aren't reasons to celebrate Mandela, but surely having just about every black actor of note play him isn't the way to do it. Another problem with these uh, race movies is they also focus exclusively on the lives of black heterosexuals. The vast majority of Hollywood movies released about about straight black folks, not uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender people. Why aren't there more movies about the struggle of black gays and lesbians in the Western world, or in the Caribbean, or Africa? Rodney Evans, a gay African-American filmmaker, does have an indie film out called The Happy Sad. It's about a black, young black gay couple. How many people have heard about this film? I'll celebrate when Hollywood starts telling the stories about people of color that have yet to be told. Now that would be Oscar worthy. Uh, I have not seen The Butler yet. I plan to at some point. Most likely it will be when it comes out on video later this year, early next year. But it is something interesting to think about in that there is a lack of, uh, of original roles there. Star Trek Deep Space Nine, I at the time applauded in the fact that they introduced a black commanding officer. But there was a subtle racism there. The first two Star Trek series, you had an Anglo-Saxon role model as captain of the Enterprise. Captain James T. Kirk, born in uh, Iowa. Then Jean-Luc Picard, born in France. Okay. But by the time you get to Benjamin Sisko, for the first two seasons of DS9, he was a commander. As a matter of fact, in the pilot episode, he was contemplating leaving Starfleet. Of course, if you watch the episode, you understand why. He was promoted to captain, I believe, in the third season. But still, to me, it was a form of racism. And for Star Trek, for all its uh, merits and pluses, it is still largely portraying to insecure white males. Like me. Because... When Voyager came out, yeah, it was the first female captain in the prominent role, but you send her ship 70,000 light years into a quadrant that has not been largely explored yet by Starfleet. Yet, if that were Picard, he would have been brought back to the Alpha Quadrant before the end of the pilot episode. Guarantee you. Don't believe me? Watch the episodes Q Who or uh, uh, where no one has gone before from the first season of The Next Generation. Just a couple of examples of how we still have a long ways to go in terms of gender and racial equality, even in Star Trek, because it still largely plays to the insecure male role, and it does a bit of a pandering, and it bothers me. But uh, I'll save that for another topic. But that kind of relates to what this... Uh, author was writing this editorial about the butler and uh, we still have a long ways to go because race and gender equality is largely about comfort about your comfort zone and when anything comes along and knocks you out of your comfort zone uh, you really notice it more and uh, comments like Ms. 7-Eleven or uh, things of that nature really, really bother me and um, so that's uh, that's where it goes from there. Uh, funny story over the weekend, and this is uh, kind of a follow-up to a story that happened uh, a few weeks ago, and I don't believe I've talked about it on this program. Uh, back in late August, I believe it was, I don't remember exactly when it was, maybe been earlier this month, I went to a local Chinese restaurant for lunch. And it's a nice little family-owned business, um, and uh, I go there frequently. Well, anyway, I go in, and this happened a few months or a few weeks ago. I asked for a Pepsi, 
Now, I'm trying to cut back on the soft drinks and give them up, and I tell you, it's a hard habit to break. But every once in a while, I'll have a Pepsi.